sorry, it can't be my drop in yet. Right. Once again, you don't need to adjust your sets. <laughs> they they decided to go with El Cheapo again. Actually, we, we, they got back. I didn't think they were coming back until yesterday. They got back. We were going to a birthday party for the young man who comes with us sometimes. And they came along. And after about 10 minutes of sitting there watching James drool into his spaghetti, <laughs> I said, I'll tell you what. <laughs> the sermon I was going to preach last week, the Saturday before, God said, no, I want you to preach on this one. I'm going, okay. So now you're getting the one you were supposed to get last week today. I said, I got one already. You don't need to do nothing. Just sit there. And he was sitting there telling me earlier today, if I start, don't take it personally. I'm going. So I hope everybody is doing well, enjoying the cool. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> oh, <that's a> <laughs> Today's uh, sermon is, is on a, a topic special to me. Give you a little bit of warning. This this topic is what I had planned for my dissertation, so you might be in trouble. So if it gets over two hours, somebody, you know, call bathroom break and we'll stop and we'll come back, okay? Not funny. All right, no, no, everybody's shaking their head. All my kids are like, no. Before we get started, though, let's start with a word of prayer. Dearly Father, Lord, we thank you once again for this incredible place that you have given to us and these incredible people that we share it with that we can come together and be with fellow believers and enjoy the fellowship enjoy each other's company and most of all to sing praises to you and to hear your message proclaimed we ask for your spirit to be with us today. We ask for your message to be heard. Lord, we're here to hear from the word from you, not from me. Be with us now. Open our hearts and minds to understand your word in a way that perhaps we hadn't before. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I don't know how many of you have a favorite book of the Bible. Is there a, one of the books of the Bible that you would call your favorite? Have you even never thought of this before? Hebrews. Hebrews, yeah. Well, all right, Hebrews. Don't read don't, don't, one you're reading. No, I'll listen to that. Everybody look at it. I just go, yeah, okay. If, if, Mine, the one we're going to look at today, is definitely my favorite in the Old Testament. And probably is, is right up there with my favorite in the entire book. So, once again, you may be in trouble. Um, if you were hoping to get to the restaurant early. <laughs> today I want to talk to you about a very special book of the Bible. A unique book book in the Bible, we'll talk about that in a minute, the book of Psalms. If y'all were here at Vacation Bible School, you would have learned how to find Psalms. Everybody know how to find Psalms? Take your Bible, open the middle. Here I don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> but if you open up in the middle, chances are pretty good you'll be in Psalms and not Jeremiah. Why is Psalm, the book of Psalms, unique in the entire Bible. What is it about Psalms that makes it so different? You know, if you ask people, they would say 
because it has poems or songs in it? Well, no. There are lots of other books in the Bible that have songs or po and in them, and poetry is everywhere. If you look in your Bible and sometimes it looks like a regular, ba a regular page in a book, that's usually some kind of narrative setting, like if you open Exodus. But if you open up Southern and it looks like poetry, if you open up the Psalms and you, you'll see in your Bibles that it's, it, you, know, you don't have paragraphs. You've got verses and stanzas like you're reading a poem or read, uh, singing a hymn. It's because it's poetry. The, he, the Old Testament is full of poetry. The, the prophets are almost all poetry. I don't know if you ever, you're ever looking through Isaiah or Jeremiah or some of the others. Not maybe not Daniel. At least the second half of Daniel kind of is, but it's just full of poetry. So it's not the fact that it has songs and po poems in it. It's not the fact that it has prayers in it. There are lots of places in the Bible where you have prayers. <laughs> Your pastor is doing a. A series on prayer, and he hasn't been to the Psalms yet, I don't think. Once, okay, I'm going to steal his thunder, hopefully. <laughs> so it's not the fact that it's songs or poetry. It's not the fact that it's prayers. Well, then what is it? Why is Psalms different from the rest of the Bible? Well, quite frankly, the rest of the Bible is God's word to us. God is speaking to us. The direction is from God down. The Psalms are different because it turns it around. It's not God speaking to us. It's us speaking to God. It goes upwards. Or if you want to get even more specific and technical, and we should, it's God telling us how to speak to him. Have you ever thought about that before? If that is true, then what is the Psalms? If the book of Psalms is God revealing to us how he wants us to pray to him or to sing to him, then what else is the book of Psalms? Instruction manual. Very good. It's a primer. An instruction manual on how to pray to God. So if Jesus, you know, the disciples, they asked Jesus and they got, they got the answer. That was good. But so this is like how to pray to God part two. And you get a whole book. All right. Well, if, if that's the purpose of the book of Psalms, or at least one of the purposes, what does that mean for us? I mean, this, this is probably news. If you've not followed this before. We've long viewed the Psalms as a collection of songs and prayers for us to express how we feel in a particular moment. Are you sad? Read the Psalms to be comforted. Are you happy? Sing along with David as he praises the Lord. Are you hurt, afraid, in distress? Commiserate with the psalmist as he goes through similar situations. You're going to need to get your Bibles out if you don't have them with you. And if you get the one in the pew, because we're going to be busy in the Psalms today. Let's just take a brief look at some of the range of things that we find in the Psalms. The first one is Psalms 23. We all know it, perhaps by heart. And, of course, that's the one I didn't leave a marker for. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. 
I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. A very well-known psalm. You probably have it memorized. If you don't, you should. That's your homework assignment. Other ones might sound vaguely familiar. Psalm 51. One of the great hymns, great psalms of the faith. Psalm 51. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness, that the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, nor take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O Lord, my O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will be declare your praise. For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with the burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, and a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Do good to Zion on your good pleasure. Build the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in right sacrifices and burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. Happy? Psalm's got it covered. You get in one of those rare moods where you, you need to confess? Should be rare. Got it covered. Psalm 88. O Lord, God of my salvation, I cry out day and night before you. Let my prayer come before you. Incline your ear to my cry. For my soul is full of troubles and my life draws near to Sheol. I am counted among those who go down to the pit. I am a man who has no strength. Like one set loose among the dead, like the slain that lie in the grave. Like those who remember you no more, for they are cut off from your hand. You have put me in the depths of the pit, in the regions dark and deep. Your wrath lies heavy upon me, and you overwhelm me with all your waves. You have caused my companions to shun me. You have made me a horror to them. I am shut in so that I cannot escape. My eye grows dim through sorrow. Every day I call upon you, O Lord. I spread out my hands to you. Do you work wonders for the dead? Do the departed rise up to praise you? Is your steadfast love declared in the grave, or your faithfulness in the Abaddon? Are your wonders known in the darkness, or your righteousness in the land of forgiveness? But I, O Lord, cry to you. In the morning my prayer comes before you. O Lord, why do you cast my soul away? Why do you hide your face from me? Afflicted and close to death from my youth up, I suffer your terrors. I am helpless. Your wrath has swept over me. Your dreadful assaults destroy me. They surround me like a flood all day long. They close in on me together. You have caused my beloved and my friend to shun me. My companions have become darkness. 
Are you having a bad day? I think he's having a little bit more than a bad day, don't you think? Anyway, Psalms got you covered. One more for right now. Maybe you're having a really bad day. Psalm 137. We all, we all, many of us know this one, at least the first half. If you're familiar with the, the musical Godspell, then you know this song. By the waters of Babylon, there we sat down and wept. When we remembered Zion, on the willows there we hung up our lyres, and for there our captors required of us songs, and our tormentors mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget its skill. Let my tongue stick to the roof of my mouth. If I do not remember you, if I do not set Jerusalem above my highest joy. And this is the part we may not have heard before. Remember, O Lord, against the Edomites, the day of Jerusalem. How they said, lay it bare, lay it bare down to its foundations. O daughter of Babylon, doomed to be destroyed, blessed shall be he who repays you for what you have done to us. Blessed shall he be who takes your little ones and dashes them against the rock. What do you do with a song like that? I guarantee you, you haven't memorized that one. You don't go around quoting it, do you? It, it, it's in the it's in the Bible. It must be God's word. That just because it's in the Bible doesn't mean that we should do that, right? Is God advocating taking babies and smashing them against rocks? So what what do we do with this passage? What do what do we do with Psalm eighty eight, one of the darkest psalm in the entire Bible? What do you do with it? Well, we do what most people do. We ignore it, right? We just forget, you know, John, why didn't you put that in my head? I'm going to have to go home and do something, watch a movie, do, go on a walk, do something, play a game, do something to get this out of my head so I don't have to remember it anymore. Sorry, that's not an option. Why is it there? What is the purpose of the Psalms? The first purpose is exactly what we've been using it for. What is the message God back and shake the mouth? Why does why is this included? It's included because this is how God wants you to pray to him. Wait, what what? Are you happy? Share it with God. Are you sad? Share it with God. Are you angry? With share it with God. Are you maybe angry at Him? The only place to do is to share it with God. Are you have have you been violated? Do you have such an intense anger that you wish to do something like Psalm 137 talks about to someone else? There's only one place to get rid of that. To share it with God. Every one of us believes that God is omniscient, right? What does that mean? That God knows everything. We, we said it before when we were explaining to the children at EBS. God knows everything you think, everything you say, everything you do. Everything you think, he knows. What is he saying in the Psalms? 
Look, I already know how you feel. The only appropriate thing for you to do is to tell me. I want to know about it. You're upset with me? I can handle it. You're having a wonderful day and you just want to share love with everybody in the world? Hey, let's do it together. Someone's been, this, been harassing you or bothering you or molesting you or whatever. And you don't know what to do with these emotions that are within you? Right here. I know what you've been through. Father, forgive them. That's the first purpose of the psalm. That's not even why we're here. This is the base level of the, why we have the psalms, and there's nothing wrong with it. It's why we're here. God knows you have feelings. God knows how strong they can be. He made you. And if we even then don't believe that, he came to earth and lived as one of us. He knows what it's like to feel angry. He knows what it's like to cry. He said so. He knows what it's like to be betrayed. It's in here. He knows. You can no longer say God doesn't know because Jesus came down. Now, he just, God didn't need to come down to know, but there's no possible excuse that we have anymore. He knows it all. Share it with him. He will show you what to do with it. But there's even more. This is part of what the Psalms are for. But it's not all that the Psalms, the Psalms are for. And perhaps not even what they are mainly for. All right then, John, what are they for? I'm glad you asked. If what I said earlier is true, that the Psalms are a primer for learning how God wants us to speak to him, then there is valley, value or I can't read, not only in the individual psalms themselves and how their author's account of his life situation helps us when we are feeling similarly, but also how they have been put together. Perhaps there is a purpose for the editing of the book and that a message from God can be found in what kinds of psalms are found in the book and even in the order that they've been given to us. As I said earlier, there's many different kinds of psalms. There's praise psalms like 23. There's Psalms of Lament. Now that's a fancy fancy church scholarship word for sad. There's Psalms of Thanksgiving. There's Psalms of Repentance, like 51. There's Psalms of Wisdom, like we're about to read in a minute. They even have Psalms they think were part of the king's coronation ceremonies. Lots of different kinds of psalms. For our purpose, we can categorize them into two ways. Praise and lament. You know, scholars have sat down and counted each one of the psalms and kind of tried, you know, they got to categorize everything. And the largest category of psalms in the book are Psalms of Lament by far. Almost half. Forty, well, I can't remember the exact number. It was 
well into the 40s. 40% or more of the psalms are psalms of lament. God wants to know if you're having a bad day. God wants to know if you have issues with someone else, with yourself, with him. You may never have heard that from the pulpit before, and that's a, that's a shame. Because you've read the Psalms, they're there. Everywhere, 40% of them. But when you start to look at the different kind of Psalms and where they fall into the canon of the Psalms, from Psalms 1 to 150, that a pattern starts to emerge. And that's what we're here to talk about. The book starts, crazily enough, with Psalm 1. And that's our scripture for today. So turn to Psalm 1 and let's stand and reread. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaves do not wither. In all that he does he prospers. The wicked are not so, but they are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. You may see. be seated. This is how the entire book starts. And I don't think it's by accident. As I said, this could be loosely, this is a, per, a psalm of wisdom, could be loosely categorized as a, as a praise psalm. But what is it all about? Basically, how, how, how you're supposed to live. If you are a man or a woman of God, this is what you should do. This is how you should be. Through times of trouble and turmoil, you will be fine. You will be like the tree planted by streams of water. Boy, if ever we've had an illustration around us, we've had that. Just driving here today, you can tell where the water is, right? You know, not brown, dead, brown, green, brown, brown, brown. I mean, Texas is like that anyway. But especially right now. You want to be by the water? Of course you do. Well, so what do you need to do? Delight in the law. Be righteous. Book of Psalms starts here. And if you kind of graft it and, you know, on a scale, praises being up and lament being down, it starts about right here. And you got praises. But if you sit there and you watch it, all of a sudden... You know, you got praises, and there's a few laments thrown in, some of the other kind. But once you get past the 50s and the 60s, it starts to do this. Until you get to the low 80s. And you've got three or four hard laments right back to back. Boom, 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 boom. What is the purpose of this?
among all the other things that the book of Psalms is, I think it's also been put together by people who want to remember one of the biggest, most horrible days in the life of an Israelite there ever was. And how you can make it right again. The history of Israel centers around two events. What are they? The first is the Exodus. Where God came and plucked them out of Egypt, brought them free, and made them his people at Sinai. To the leadership of the greatest man of, of the Old Testament, Moses. Moses' head and shoulders above everyone else, even David. David is like a, a second Moses. It's the defining moment for the people of Israel because that is the time when they stop being just a nomadic people or slaves, whatever else they were. Now they are the nation of God. They have taken the covenant. And as we know, it doesn't take long for them to mess it up. The last book about Moses is Deuteronomy. And what is Deuteronomy? His farewell speech. And he sits there and he goes through all the things they need to know to be the people of God. High on the list, and we've discussed this already when we did Daniel, is the blessings and curses from the, for the covenant. If you do these things, you will be blessed. You will, I have given you a wonder, I will give you at that point a wondrous land full of milk and honey. You'll have everything you need. All you've got to do is worship me and obey these commandments that I've given you. And then he details this is what will happen if you don't do what you're supposed to do. And he goes through all the things that will happen. Which leads us to the second great event. Maybe great is not the word. Great isn't significant, not great isn't awesome. The second great event in the, law, in the history of Israel is what? The exile. We just spent months on it in Daniel, and then not all that long ago when we were in Nehemiah. Despite everything Moses told them, despite everything the judges told them, that Samuel told them, the prophets who have been living before told them, you had choice A, do good, be blessed. Choice B, diso disobey God, be cursed. They chose curtain B. And then we're shocked when God kicked them out. Came in and wiped them out, except for a few. Many were lost and scattered, and some were taken far away, like Daniel, never to come home. I think Psalms was edited by someone who wanted this not to be lost. Because what do you do if you are exiled? How do you make it right again? What did Daniel do? Psalms, praise, just 
down to the lowest point you've ever been in your life. That's where the Israelites were. And then comes Psalm 90. The turning point for the book. And the turning point for Israel. And who else is Psalm 90 a psalm of but Moses himself? Again, not coincidence. The psalmist brings Moses back for several reasons. One, he is the giver of the law. God gave it to Moses. Moses gave it to the people. He, if there's anybody can remind them of what the, the dictates of the covenant that they are supposed to have kept between them and Yahweh, it's Moses. But there's also another key characteristic about Moses. Remember back in all the stories you hear about Moses. It happens more than once. You get a scene where Moses and God are off to the side. And God is like, I'm going to wipe them out. I, I, I've had enough. I'm not going to take it anymore. I'm just, I'm just, they're gone. And what does Moses do? He says, your God, you do what you want. But you know what the rest of the people will say. You know what those Egyptians will say. He brought them out of the, Egypt, but then he couldn't save them from the army. Or he brought them out of the Egypt, but then he got them lost in the, in the mountain, in the Sinai Peninsula. He brought them out of Egypt and made them wander around in the Sinai, but he couldn't keep them fed, or he couldn't keep them watered, or he couldn't keep their clothes on their body. And what kind of testimony will that be about your name? And then God says, you're right, I won't do it. In fact, if you want to get real controversial, the word there is repent. I don't think God repents. I think it's more of a test for Moses than anything else. But time and time again, when God seems to be on the verge of wiping out the people of Israel, Moses stands up and says, "We, you cannot do this. Give them another chance. Help them. We will get it right. We will get it fixed. Just give us another chance. And I don't think Psalm 90 is a coincidence. God, Mo, the psalmist editor, has Moses appealing once again to God for mercy on the behalf of his people. So what did the people do? We saw it in Daniel. It starts where? With each individual. And repentance. Lord, from this day on, even though I'm in the midst of exile, I'm going to choose the blessings. And that means I get myself reconciled with you, and then that means I start being obedient. In slavery, if that's where I have to be at first. Or if I'm one of the few that were left in a desolate land, abandoned seemingly by their God. I start today with me. I will repent. I will restore. I will reconcile. Then I will be obedient and I will start doing what I should have been doing from day one. You say, if I do these 
things, then you will bless me. Then I'm going to hold you to that, Lord, and I'm going to start doing my part. You've always done your side. The problem has always been us. What We're in Babylon. What's going to start happening if maybe I start doing what I should have been doing all along? Will you be true? Will you be faithful? That's what Daniel was saying in his prayer. It starts with me. Praise, deep lament. Moses arises and begs for a second chance. You know, we never read that, did we? We need to read it. Psalm 90. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. And you should be hearing phrases you've heard all your life. You return man to dust and say, Return, O children of man, for a thousand years in your sight are but as yesterday when it is past, or as a watch in the night. You sweep them away as with a flood. They are like a dream, like grass that is renewed in the morning. In the morning it flourishes and renewed. In the evening it fades and withers. For we are brought to an end by your anger. By your wrath we are dismayed. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. For all our days pass away under your wrath. We bring our years to an end like a sigh. The years of our life are seventy, or even by reason of strength eighty. Yet their span is but toil and trouble. They are soon gone, and we fly away. Who considers the power of your anger and the wrath, your wrath according to the fear of you? So teach us to number our days, that we may get a heart of wisdom. Return, O Lord, how long? Have pity on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love, that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us, and for as many years as we have seen evil. Let your work be shown to your servants, and your glorious power to their children. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands upon us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. After Psalm 90, there's a marked change in the book of Psalms. Yes, there will continue to be Psalms of Lament throughout the rest of the book. It's including Psalm 137 centered on the people in exile. Those were, pe those were people in Babylon. And that's how they felt. After Psalm 90, their focus begins to change. No longer as much on what God has done for the psalmist, even the praises before were more focused on the psalmist than on God. Now they are praising God for who God is. Because he is worthy of praise. Whether he does anything else for us or not. Just by the sheer fact that he is God. That he is the creator. If he never does a single other thing. He is worthy of all our praise. And the Psalms begin to give it to him. Finally, Israel is beginning to worship in the manner that they should have been all along. This newfound, or better yet, rediscovered way of praising culminates in the majestic Psalm 150. Praise the Lord. Praise God in His sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with trumpet sound. Praise him with lute and harp. 
Praise him with tambourine and dance. Praise him with strings and pipe. Praise him with sounding cymbals. Praise him with loud crashing cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Psalm starts with this is the way to be righteous. And it ends with let everything that has breath praise the Lord. What is the book of Psalms about? It's about revival. You know, it's a word that we say that we like. It's a word that we say that we want. But do you really? We want revival. We want revival in this church. We want revival in this country. But revival is always something that everyone else should be doing, right? It's not how it works. And the, the editor of the Psalms wanted to encapsulate it. You want revival? It starts with you. Amen. Restore your relationship with God. If you need revival, that is the problem. God is not moved. It's like the old story about the, the, the older man and the woman in the, in, the, in the car. And they were talking about when they first had a car back in the 60s. You know, she used to sit right back, right next to him, and he would hold her and drive. And then years go by, and she's in her own seat, and he's in his own seat. And she's telling him, you know, you never hold me anymore. And he, and he goes, I didn't move. <laughs> if God and you are like this, What happened? God didn't move. You get yourself right. You confess. If you don't believe in him, if you are not a Christian, then guess what? You're like this. Doesn't matter what you say, doesn't matter how many times you come to church, doesn't matter how many hymns you sing, doesn't matter. You're like this. But God is calling you to come to Him to reconcile. If you could sum up this book in one word, it would be reconciliation. You are never more in the will of God than when you are practicing the ministry of reconciliation. Amen. Whether it's yourself to God or other people to God, that is what you should be doing. That is what this church should be doing. And once this is fixed... And we are once again restored. What happens? That's when the praise starts coming. And it's natural. Because now you are right again with God. Everything that bothered you is gone. Sure, you still have trials. Sure, you still have problems and obstacles, but you and God are in lockstep. And he is with you, and you can handle anything that comes your way. Amen. I said it before, I'm going to say it again. If prayer is the catalyst for change, then praise is the fuel. Okay.
Okay, you've prayed. You started it. Now it's time to guess up the car. You do that through his praise. How does that work? Real quickly, I know we're over. Psalm 22, 3, among other things, says that God inhabits the praise of his people. Now, that's not, that gets twisted into by worship pastors. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to like summon God <laughs> and we're going to do it in our worship so everybody needs to sing. It, it don't work that way. But there are times when you are worshiping that you feel his presence in the room. Because God works through praise. Another one of the Johnisms. God insists on working through people. You may not like that. I would argue, well, Lord, why do you do that? That's the way he does things. He works through other people. That's why we have a church. That's your job. You are to be here and let God work through you to meet the needs of people around you. Their biggest need is to know of God. They also have other needs. You can meet them. You get yourselves right. You dedicate yourself to being obedient and whatever God tells you, and then you start to praise. When we sing here, everyone has favorite songs. I have favorite songs. There's nothing wrong with singing favorite songs. But the important thing is, we're not so much that we sing what we want to hear, but we sing what God wants to hear. You know, the four of us that stand up here, I hate to, to, to say this, I hope you don't get too depressed, but none of us are go going to appear on The Voice next week. <laughs> we all know that, right? There, there aren't any superstars. And that, that's okay. In fact, that's the way it ought to be. Because this is not a performance. These people are not performing for your benefit. You are not an audience. You are a congregation. And they are leading you to praise Him. He is the audience. You are the participant. If there's any way I could get them off and have everybody singing or everybody playing something or just doing something and everyone be praising to God, that's the way it should be. Amen. We're working at that. The focus is not on us, just like the psalmist learned. It's not on me, it's on him. And God doesn't care what you sound like. In fact, if you ever been in a huge group of people singing, many of you have had any kind of music instruction, you know what I'm telling you is true. You've been in a huge concert hall, or you've been in a stadium with Chris Tomlin or whoever, and there's thousands of, tens of thousands of people singing. You ever notice something? You can understand every word. The pitch is perfect. The diction is perfect. The balance is perfect. How does that happen? Because God is taking everyone, little pieces, and he puts them together, and the whole is greater than the individual parts. Yeah. We're just one voice, supposedly, of 
thousands of churches across this nation who sing praises to him every Sunday morning. You sing to him like he saved you. And you don't worry about what the person next to you sings. Whether they're good or they're bad doesn't matter. God wants to heart. Start singing like that and watch what he does. Time and time again, it's in the Bible. You don't have to take my word for it. It's there. Paul and Silas. Jericho. All over. How praise affects. How God works it when his people praise. That is what the Psalms have. God, we love you. Even at times if we don't show it like we should. Convict us when we're astray. Bring us back into relationship with you that is pure and holy like you are. Fill us with your love. And unleash us on a world that needs to know of you. That needs to be returned to a right relationship with you as well. If there's anyone here who doesn't know that, relationship he doesn't have that relationship with you or maybe they do and it's gone to where it should never have been Lord we ask for your help to get it back I promise start with ourselves to do what is right to be obedient to your law to your commandments and most of all we promise to praise you in the manner you are deserving for you are worthy of all praise all this we pray in the precious name of your son and for his sake Jesus, then we pray.